last two I've played to is more years. Shawnee described a perilous being wrought like a massive panther 
swimming through rivers with the power to destroy and renew. Alligator mound, no. I net the past and future in panther skin. My son's ferocious cry, banged and thawed grip on the skin of the top of the moon. I clamp down on the tributary's gush, lay claim to our place here. to read for you all today is called American Towns, and to give a little bit of context, um, the Eastern Shawnee tribe now is located um, around a reservation in northeastern Oklahoma, but that's not our traditional homeland at all. Uh, traditionally, the Eastern Shawnee tribe was located in the Ohio area, so um, this poem talks a little bit about the cultural journey from Oklahoma to Ohio. American Towns, Seneca, Missouri. Soft wash of casino jangle seeps through the Pontiac's cracked window. The map flutters on the dashboard, one corner grit soaked. Sparse Ozark wash of tawny green. A herd of buffalo lowing in the side pasture. Here is the voyage, conjured homeland to conjured homeland. No, not that clawed trajectory of the past, but a fierce conception that quickens and scrapes inside just the same. The drive to Ohio will take 11 hours and 48 minutes, cost $195 in gas. Chillicothe, in the subtle semantics of Shawnee, a tightened fist of connotation, clan name, and principal city, all human systems working in harmony. Limpid sachet of corn tassels along the byway. Historical markers beckon the reader to plunge an arm into the loam Tweeze with fingers to feel half empty. No rocks to blend the path to bed with plowshare. What heirloom fields of shiny corn hung under the crust beside the carbon of burned council houses? August weeds of bad axe creek. Drought thrust large boulders jutting up waste time. Deep grooves in the center for grinding corn. What is owed grits in the corners of the mouth? Plaque on the museum's door in Xenia extols a Revolutionary War hero. The ground on which this council house stands is unstained with blood, and as pure as my heart, which wishes for nothing so much as peace and brotherly love. Summer school kids mill around the museum. The teacher introduces the panel of tribal council members as remnants of the once great Shawnee tribe. Listless murmur of pencils across paper. In the front room, a volunteer curator leans over a diorama, anxious to capture the real story of a revolutionary war camp. He stipples red paint onto the sandy ground, simulating the gore of a military flogging, points with a paintbrush into the next room, where 53 letters from 1783 broke the captive trades with the Delaware and Shawnee. Wan shades of ink from blanched olive to corn flour, blotted in a rough, horrifying sway of long dead hands, each one made phylum by the promise of whiskey. <clears throat> Leaving Xenia that evening on an old Shawnee trade route retracing concrete, Monmouth's town, Wapakoneta, Blue Jacket's town, Makachak, Wapatonka, Xenia, the influence of the pollen upon the form of the fruit. I want my ink to bellow. Where is this ground? I'm staying with one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Cassandra Lopez. And Cassandra is a Chicana, Kali, Luisano, and Tongue Varida, raised in Southern California. And excuse me if I don't pronounce all those names right. She is a winner of the 2013 Native Writers Chapbook Book Award from the Sequoia National Research Center and is a founding editor of the journal As Us, A Space for Women of the World. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here because I actually teach English at North. So I'm, I'm, it's a good opportunity to come to another campus. Um, I'm going to be reading the first 48. 
um, the Tapas Tower poem. Both these poems are from a collection I'm working on called Brother Bullet. The First 48. I marathon a and E's The First 48, but this is no race. This, there is no finish line, no victory here. It's rough course, lots of stumble, and blood cake knees at, that break fresh to liquid. I take comfort in television, even as my screen fills with brown bodies, so like brothers done made dead. After bullet night, I promise to never turn away from the rib ache of the left behind, the long scope of loss, but I watch in mute, to mute sorrow's steady beat, the pulse of regret. Their guttural cries echo here in the chest, in the capital, apart, where I rooted brother, so he grows from muscle to memory to story. When nephew enters, I'm fast to change channels, wanting to save him from death, the way I couldn't save him from sun pain. Sometimes we have to mouth knuckle the red of pain to white, so not to unfurl to a scream. I watch for clues with the uncertainty of the unsolved forever. The weight of X heavier than anything we carry. X of fear, X of terror, wraps itself into an equation we look for city to solve, each face a possibility, a mutation of the unknown. The equation of grief, the equation of self, always ends in grief a syllable too small to contain what it must. Our first 48 has passed, and still we have X. So I speak to the television, to Miami and Baltimore's detectives, more than anyone working brother's case. I see myself in the blurred out shaky face of witness, and I try to imagine bullet being questioned, some resolution, how our episode would end. where his father could not outrun death, I tell him the truth, but he feel heavy with the weight of witness. A wild gunshot ricochets in my throat. He wants to know if it happened in the backyard where his father as a boy once raced behind orange and sweet lemon trees, scrambling over warped fences to escape BB, BB gun games, shoulder shot by other boys. Brother was a big target. Tiny bullets pierced summer skin, but they smiled as the gunplay with those they called brother. These easy pains he'll clean. They are not the ones that mark some boys. Boys that always carry those scars, even after wounds are no longer circled red. Mother tells first son not to wear his hoodie over his head. Don't walk to the corner store alone. Be back before the street lights turn on. She says, just like she told brother as a boy. Are these the warnings brother would have given his son, knowing that sometimes it is not enough because some boys, some brown boys, are never just boys to some? Very, very good, very good. approximately 120,000 Japanese Americans and Japanese held without due process for approximately three years or more. Matsuda has a PhD in education from the University of Washington and was a secondary teacher, university counselor, state level administrator, school principal, assistant superintendent, educational consultant, and visiting professor at Seattle University. Today is here as a poet. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for being here. Uh, I just want to add that uh, of the 120,000 taken, 
to the camps based on race. Race was their crime. Mm -hmm. Being Japanese mm -hmm. was their crime. Two thirds were American citizens. Fifty percent were children. And we represented a threat to the country. Again, my name is Larry Matsuda. I was born in Block 26, Barracks 2. My number is 11464 D. Everyone had a number. My father was A, my mother was B, my brother was C, and I was D. The first one I'm going to read is entitled World War II Route to Freedom, and it is in Raven's Chronicle. Idaho does not accept our dead. Twin Falls mortuaries turn away Minidoka Japanese. Dr. Abbott calls Aunt Amy's time. Medics in white gently slide her from the bunk for a journey to Salt Lake City, first excursion out of prison gates. Cousin, he Cousin Hizako snatches shadows passing in her dreams. Don't worry. Amy whispers, Hell, Tetsuo, I'm fine. Tetsuo, her son, a U.S. soldier, volunteers from Minidoka to defend freedom in Europe. He takes aim and blasts the padlock. Gates of Dachau swing open. Nazis have no cold. Crematorium silent. Odors of death permeate the air, something like a mixture of chocolate, pudding, urine, feces and rotting meat, naked bodies stacked like tangled tree limbs, pungent fluids trickle down drains. In Minidoka, coal rages in pot deli stoves. When did we hear of cre crematoriums? It seems we knew. It seems we always knew. When our boys came home, we knew for sure. Thank you. The next one is entitled, The Noble Thing. And the vocabulary word here is katakanai, which is a Japanese word for, it can't be helped. The Noble Thing. Dad never talked about Minidoka. That was the noble thing. Before World War II, it was Garfield High School for him. Ice skating on Green Lake, dances at Lake Wilderness Lodge, later later his ownership of Elk Grocery on Seneca Street. He and my mother were married in 1941, 10 months later to be removed, forced into the Minidoka concentration camp. Mom was five months pregnant in August with my older brother, Alan. With blackout curtains drawn, the train left Puyallup and climbed the Cascade Mountains until the land flattened and the inescapable sun transformed the train cars into a moving sauna. People gasped, small, panicked breaths from the superheated air. She got the gun eye. It can't be helped. The train stopped by the side of an unmarked road in the Idaho desert, released its passengers miles from any station. Rumors spread they would be shot were marched to death, their bodies stacked, then carried to some awaiting ditch. Nowhere to run, they walk in their best shoes in the gritty sand, as on the face of the moon. The heat caused some to faint as they carried all that they could. Three years later, Dad returned to Seattle after the war, developed a bleeding ulcer, lost his janitor job at Earl Hotel. Depression took Mom away like invisible guards. She was a stranger, a stick-like figure with arms and legs, poking out of a white smock, pacing the sidewalk next to the Western State Hospital. Turn around. Dad never talked about it. None of it. I never heard him say the word, Minidoka. Daman, endure the unbearable with dignity. Shikataganai. My best friend's mother chose pills for suicide. After school, Randy, my neighbor, opened the garage door and found his father in a black suit, his best hanged by the neck. Shikata Ganai, 
the same path. Others see I'm Japanese children's numbers unknown. Shikata Gadai. We, however, never talked about it. That was a noble thing to do. Mm. Thank you. of something, a delicate crack, a queen's hand, deliberate like a desert march, debased like the blood on flagstones, oozing from the man flung over the emperor's parapet, deconstructing Delhi flings me off my throne, and the L, L, La, La, like the music of peacocks and lushness of thunder and Goldmoher greens coming to desiccated river bed, D, Di, tadim, 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 to teem with millions of pulses and notes, to scream with voices and crickets and goats, L, L, luminous like a jewel, L, the only one, like lapping a long slake of the Jumna's marble, of the, like lapping a long slake of the Jumna's winding path or the watery flight of a million crows on Jama Masjid's marble domes falling into my soul. La ilaha illa la, or Darya Ganj, the river city leaking lords and lackeys and broken down lovers praising high, exalting he, high and mighty he, he whose word is Tola Giri, whose diamond daggers flends me, he who frees, he who foresees these heights, I live my life retreating, my only edict, Delhi, beloved Bodhi tree, and I, your detainee, home and heaven, he, he, incandescent like the ember always within me, demarcating the line beyond which my fortune lies, Delhi, Delhi, escaping your ties, D, D, he, he, your lightning, my decree, D, D, lie, lie. Delhi, where my high, mm. high hearts lies. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Number two is the one that's in the issue of the Chronicles. <coughs> it's called X. X is the name you cannot speak. X for Malcolm. X censors history. X, the axis on which our moral fictions turn. 
X is a, road, a prohibition of transgression. In Twin Falls, two men, or a man and a boy, or a boy and a scared man turned boy, or two terrified animals cross. And X for toxic pheromones through blood, then blood over bad luck. X is where the sidewalk cracks converge, the cracks in his sternum, a series of graceful X's radiating outward from the single stigmatum of the nine millimeter sacrament, a trick of geometrics momentarily infusing the receiver with an otherworldly radiance. Then a body so marred, they called it John Doe, opened an X-file. Now there's a boy X'd out, canceled, unable to overcome chromosomal barriers in a place both xenophile and xenophobe, an unmapped place called America, while black. Now X exhumes demons, exhorts judge and jury, cites exigencies of these times. X sanitizes our slurs. In this game, the Xbox black box, X rates our pornographic desire to X ray anyone neither with us nor against us. But for a black boy, the whole country might as well be X rated. X taped over mouths forbidden to speak what we all know to be true, but even so, we can't quite figure out what we want to say to this dead boy. To find the X of a kiss for his broken body or violently X out his eyes. Now, in this broken country, lamb's blood X's privilege the exalted, exclude death by accident of birth. Now Xmas foretells the Golgotha finally come to our gated communities, the dying hope that we'd be absolved if we crucified just one guilty man, not to sacrifice at the altar of an America unwilling to own his multiplied external life spheres, but rather to be Messiah of our excuses, Messiah of our expiations, Messiah who excises guilt and shame for what we can't help feeling, what we fail to burn at once, what we herd into jail cells, cross-hatched with bloody nail scratches, what all those hellfires, riding blind drones, wreaking fear pheromones, plunging to flashing X's on foreign maps, could not expunge. No crossbeam could bear that weight. So now, our strange, confused, Hispanic, Jewish Messiah, hold aloft your crowbar and lead us past unspeaking crosses in the churchyard, past unspeakable rows of red X's through all those sullied names, and find us one clean white sheet. Okay, this time I want you to lie. How many people write poetry? 
Oh, I should see all the hands go up. <laughs> okay. And if you feel so moved, you might want to write a poem today, but we'll talk about that during the session period. Okay. So, the first quotation of three. The time will come, and in less than 10 years, when children in the public schools will be taught practically everything by moving pictures, certainly they will never be obliged to read history again. And this is from D.W. Griffith, one of our early filmmakers, who made a film called Birth of a Nation. For him, Birth of a Nation was the birth of the Klan. It had nothing to do with the Constitution. So for those of you who are interested in film, check out Gone with the Wind. Find out how popular that film is in this country, how much money it's made. It's still being shown. Go online. Check it out. Okay. Um, second quotation. Consider the source. Okay. I used to get into um, drag out fights with my students. You know, I believe in, in arguing. And sometimes these arguments got kind of heated. And I really loved to win. But there were times when the students, you know, were right. And this one quotation is something that's just in me. Okay. So think about it. Consider the source. So whenever I hear something, that's what I do. I consider the source and I weigh it. And it's one of the most valuable things that I learned when I was teaching here. And I want you to know that I taught, well, a long time, but I also learned from my students. That was just too nice. Okay. Um, okay, third one, you may know. You've been hoodwinked, you've been bamboozled. <laughs> what is that? Spike Lee, Malcolm X. Well, Spike Lee has made a film called Bamboozled, but it's Malcolm X. Malcolm, Malcolm X. And that quotation means so much to me. Me too. Because I don't like to be fooled. Me too. Or, you know, the worst than that. So that gives you an idea of kind of the spirit that moves me. Okay. So I said three quotations. That was first. Next, a little story. Okay. So in another lifetime, I used to perform at uh, Bumbershoot and Northwest Club Life and places like that. And one day I did a reading at the Intamon, the then Intamon Theater, and I opened for this Scott Heron. Now, I hope you know who he is. If you don't, go online, go, on, go everywhere and find his music because he's important. And the reason I give this as a story or a quotation is that when I opened for him, of course I got to read first, and I was standing here in the theater, huge number of people. And so I said, please, please fix the key light. You're in the theater, you know what the key light is. And, all that stuff. and then I heard myself say, I dedicate this reading to the liberation of the human spirit. I had no idea where that came from. <laughs> but mm. I had to leave it. And so I want you to know that that's what my poetry is all about. All right. Okay. So, I guess it's time for the poems. Okay, first poem. I, I'm going to read two poems, and one poem is what I call a dilemma poem, and the other is an affirmation poem. I guess I need to know, does anybody here know who James Baldwin is? I do. Yeah. Okay, just one, one person who James Baldwin. He's a writer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He's, um, well, look him up. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. He's important. And it's going to begin with an epigraph, which means it's a little uh, saying right after the title. Mirror woman. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? Brothers Grimm, Snow White. Hmm. Let me tell you something. I am a woman of African descent, and that isn't just something. You hear me? It is something. Yes. I am a woman of African descent. In a public library restroom, caught a sister standing behind me, staring in the mirror at me. Are you mixed, she says, the back of my head. I say to the mirror, what? As in, what's wrong with you, sister? Are you mixed, she says. One more time. Gives me the once over, as though she paid attention and was entitled. Now I shake my hands dry. I say to the woman in the mirror, 
what, what, what manners did you not get from your mama? Tell me that. She blinks hard, like I'm some kind of puzzle. Mixed, she says, you know, as in mixed. No, 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 I say. I am not mixed. I'm nobody's mixed anything. I hear my voice saying, I am a woman of African descent, <laughs> just like you. Yes. Passing, she says. Life would be easier, she says. Easier for what, I almost say. The price of the ticket, I say. That's what James Baldwin would say. Who's he, she says. You could pass, you could do it. I want to hug her. Maybe I want to give her my skin. I move away, leaving her to talk with that other woman in the mirror. Displacement, and uh, I just uh, 
like this gentleman said, uh, to know that uh, you know racism isn't just you know a black and white thing. You know, it's just you know what I'm saying, and, and that that uh, just gives me a broader scope and appreciation of, of other people's plight. Like when the lady, um, you know, Shani, Shani, yeah, I was raised in Ohio, so you were touching a lot of nerves and, and, and things in me. And um, yeah, the towns you were mentioning, the Chillicothe, that's now a prison, you know, and then Xenia. And, and, but I really didn't know that we're in Ohio and what basically uprooted to Oklahoma. So, so, and it's just like your up, up, the uprooting of being in Seattle, your family, and then putting them on a train and going to Idaho, you know, and 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 and, uh, and the Chicano lady is that what that is that the correct term, the Chicano? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, that was very touching. What you shared it was very touching, uh, and I really appreciate it. You too, ma'am. God bless the child that has his own. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So what's coming up is all the connections that you're finding. And, you know, I mean, when I sort of stand here and look out at the room, I know, God, there's a lot of stories in this room that have to do, you know, with this topic and related things. And this is one of the reasons for writing, right, is, to, is, is by sharing stories, whether it's through poetry or whatever, that we do help one another connect with one another's experience, walk in some different shoes and stuff. So, you know, let's let's hear from some other people and you might have bits of stories in your own history that you want to share. That's fine. Yes. Um, this is for you. Uh, did the experience with your family and um, their displacement, did that kind of lead you into education um, or like, were those influences kind of guiding you into what you do now? Professionally, no. Um, the, the stories led me into anger mm. Mm. and questioning how one can forgive. And I've not reached forgiveness. Mm. And I don't think I ever will. And I write about it, and it's not cathartic for me but I find it's cathartic for someone else, for other people. So that in itself is okay. Yeah, I feel like everybody was really moved by your, your story, so yeah, that makes sense. Anyone else? Well, just one other comment. Someone asked me, you know, how come you, you can't forgive? And the suggestion is, you know, if someone does you wrong and you go up to them and you say, I forgive you, They'll say, oh, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. the, the, the comment was, the person who did the wrong mm -hmm. has to ask for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And then you can forgive. Mm. Ooh-wee, yeah. that's a bar right there. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> that going on that one. Are there no serious that we have to see live in a society that's unequal, right? And it's unequal on the basis of a lot of the injustices that happened in the past, right? So to be able to forget about that, essentially is an endorsement of the way that our society is. And yet, you know, we have, uh, you know, a society that's based on structural racism. We see it every day in the work that we do. Uh, and, you know, I, I agree with you, Larry. I think it's, you know, anger can be a healthy thing because it fuels you to actually shed light on these issues and put them out there for the world. Uh, and, you know, to be asked to let go of that, I think, is, is standing on a kind of privilege that,
and we, when she heard my poem, then she went, oh my God, I didn't know. And then she, she started going on and on about what I didn't know. And so I think we need to be perceptive. We need to understand what's happening. And then if you're right, there's another bonus as well. Because then you can explore whatever you're feeling about. And you, you discover you're not alone. I think that's one of the things. Yes. I want to piggyback on that because um, there's, there was an item in the news right around the time that we were sort of gathering up the submissions for this issue. And we would like to have included something about this in the issue, but there just wasn't time. But probably some of you caught this. And this happened in Athens, in the Rama community. And I'm of Rama descent on my mother's side, so I have a particular sense of connection still, and I'm writing about that. In, the Holocaust experience of the Rama. But do you remember there was an incident where this little blonde girl was taken from her parents yeah. or family in Athens because she couldn't possibly be a Rama because she was so blonde. Therefore, she had been kidnapped, which is one of the age-old stereotypes of gypsy people, is that they are still children. And then, you know, following on the way of that, two more blonde children, Rama children, were taken away from their families in Ireland. Same argument. And in every case, it turned out that these were the biological children. And that this thing about color and trying to define everything just by skin, I mean, the absurdity of it, not yes. that much, but the absolute absurdity that these children the, the privilege of, that goes with being blonde swung the other way in this instance. If you're blonde, you can't stay with your family. Meanwhile, the rest of the camp and all the other camps that people live in, the conditions that made them say, well, she was, it wasn't fit for her to live there. Has anything happened to improve those conditions for the community as a whole? Nothing. So, you know. I see this intersection going on all over the world. Any other comments? Oh, well, I, I need to say one thing before I run. Uh, first of all, I say that uh, I, I, I have a class at, at uh, 11.30, and for whatever reason, I think maybe it's medication I take. Usually about 12.30, I fall asleep. And I know, but just do it. And of course, I'm, I'm asked to, I'm dismissed. You can, you can leave the house. I'm not going to say what that individual is. I'm not going to put her, I'm not going to put her out on the front street, Miss Sandy. But uh, uh, I felt that about to happen as I was sitting here. And I just, I had to fight it because I, I knew that this, and you people will be here explaining all that you have experienced throughout life. This was something worth staying awake for. <laughs> 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 I just kept falling. Thank <laughs> <laughs> well, you. donated a copy of my book to your library, so it's over there on the left-hand side. I'm selling my books, it says $14, but for you today only $5 cash, American, and you're out of here, not even sign it, just because you are who you are. 
Well, my question again, I'm going to put down them out there. In regards to Miss J.T. Stewart's readings, where is what is what is uh, my book? In regards to your your books, where, where are they sold? Right now, well, the main thing is I'm right along with Paul Johnson. They look like they look like this. And I'm going to sell these to them. Everybody would like to buy one? Yes. Now, as far as my other work, I'm in the process of getting my, my, my print work done in a different way, but I can find most of my own online now. Anybody wants to know? Fingers, and I just want to say that some people know where they come from, you know, generations back, looking up your heritage. Okay, I can only take my heritage back two generations, that's it. And so this poem is actually about my cultural DNA. In fact, this is So tonight we're having a poetry night event featuring Amir Suleiman, he's a Deaf Jam poet or Platinum from California. And it's going to be from 6 to 8 at Eric's computer. So I've brought some flyers to pass around. Thank you everyone for joining us. Again, if you have a little yellow slip, I'm going to ask that you fill out the survey saying what you like. What else you'd like to see? We'd like for this to be a productive hour for you all. Um, thank you for coming. Again, we have some texts that you can check out. And let's thank our guests today one more time. Thank you.